All right, before we talk about chess poems, I'd like to give a layman's appreciation of what I think a poem is. It's when you take the common, mundane surfaces of language and use them to express something hidden, maybe something mysterious that was beneath the language that you were just riding along with in your normal day-to-day -day life. Oftentimes there will be a feeling of elation, of joy that you've discovered something. Maybe you even shed a tear, but there's a feeling of like, oh, maybe even my consciousness or my awareness has been expanded through this experience. And oftentimes there's a feeling of awe at the mastery of the person who crafted the poem, right? A mastery of the language. So that's what I'm using to talk then about chess poems. I think for hundreds of years, it's been acknowledged that the end game study has been its own kind of poem, where again, you use the common features of the chess, right? And you show something deeper and magical in it. So for example, in this position, it is very surprising that white can win. Very surprising, this is a study from Trotsky. Uh, and there's some very beautiful positional themes in this victory as well. So if you wanna to try to solve it, you know, you're gonna need a moment. But I just wanna use it as an example of, oh, this is a chess poem that someone has composed. Like someone had an idea and they worked at it. They probably didn't have this original position to start with. They just had an idea of how it might work and then it evolved. What I'd like to say is there's a different kind of chess poem, and that I would like to call as a strategic or just a position that might arise in chess and that someone has really uh, found and worked through. And so today I'm using this book, Strategic Chess Exercises, which I'm really a big admirer of. Um, and this was, I got turned on to this book by Michael Franco, who's in the Chess Dojo training program, and he was on the Perpetual Chess Podcast with Benjamin Johnson. Great podcast if you're interested in books. Not all problem books are created the same. In fact, a lot of problem books are, are the problems themselves are discovered using the computer. Like the computer says, oh, someone's winning here, and then the computer spits out a, a solution. What this book does, and I'm really a big admirer of, is finds some kind of idea in a game. And maybe it's not even winning, but it's just a plan. And then the author, Bricard, has clearly shown this to several students, and they've worked through it, and they have a human sense of what the problems involved are in the position. And so for a chess poem, what I like is with these problems, um, I'm able to immerse myself in these. These are quite difficult, I would say. There's no, very few of these, I saw it and I was like, I know what the answer is. I always had to really kind of go deep and imagine like what's going on in the position. Now this one, uh, I thought it was clever, was given as the final problem. And it was clever in that it suggested uh, that the whole book was about kind of poems in this sense, and that here also there's some very nice strategic ideas that White has to use to win the game. In fact, I don't think you can full, you could try to calculate it out, but you can envision, you would have to first envision strategically what the solution might be, the approach might be before you even try to start working it out. Okay, so, Let's begin then with this example. And I showed this to the US Chess School. I really like this. There's a lot of examples in this book I like. Um, this one's kind of interesting to me from a personal perspective because uh, I had this position several times as a kid, uh, comes out of a known opening. And as a kid, I always wanted to rush with the pawn breaks. And I have a coach who's yelling at me precisely for that kind of thing even now. And the pawn break here would be a4 to try to induce b4, and then we get the c4 square. Great, strategic aim completed, white is better. Okay, 
So one of the cool things about this book is it's not just telling you, okay, what white to move and play the best plan. It's saying bows. Uh, maybe think about A4 and what black would do. So a lot of these problems are directive in the sense that Bricard is directing us to something interesting in the position, the poem of the position, if you like. And, um, you know, you have to think about it for a second. And then you realize, well, wait a second. If I play A4, black plays C4. Uh-oh. And now, if I move the bishop back, black will get these beautiful pawns rolling into me. And then if I take, my knight goes somewhere, I don't even know where, and then black gets to play knight c5. You could also play a5 first. And I don't even know how to evaluate this position, but I know that black should be kind of happy with this blockade, even though he's down a pawn. They are down a pawn, okay? So one of the great things, again, about the awe of mastery of a poem is that in the game, Polygievsky is playing white, we actually see a master at work and white plays this move, boom. This might seem like a small deal, but this is the kind of thing that keeps me playing chess. It's a very deep move that expresses a lot of control over the position. First of all, it's just nice to defend the pawn, but really we are intending backing this bishop up and only then playing a4 so that we do not give black the resource of the pawn sacrifice. Beautiful. Notice, if black plays b4 now, well, then always I will have knight a4, right? So for example, c4 takes b4, knight a4, and the knight is doing a great job fighting for the blockade square. Not good for black. So I'll just briefly show how this game went. Rookie one, beautiful. Again, very strong prophylactic play. Bishop f1, delicious. Rookie eight, maybe there's a better move, but in any case, a4. And now we have achieved our strategic aim and the game goes on. White is clearly better. And then you get to see how the game actually played out with pretty extensive notes. And here, I imagine the publisher must have thrown a fit when Bricard first brought the book to the publisher because he shows the whole game and then kind of gives detailed notes about how the game progressed from here, which allows you to see how the strategic conception, how the plan actually plays out. Okay, let me. I could show many examples, but I'm going to show just one more. And uh, this is from the great Ulf Anderson. And I showed the first move, but it's okay. <laughs> first of all, let's just stare at this position for a second. Um, many players, including myself, let's imagine you were gonna come to this position earlier on in the game. Would you believe that you had something here? Interesting question. I think a lot of GMs would say to themselves, okay, maybe I'm a little bit better, but really, really boss, could I do something here? And so let's just say a couple obvious things. It's a beautiful thing that our pawn is on a dark square so that we can take away the bishop's counterplay like this. Okay. So um, then you say to yourself, ah, bishops of opposite color, buddy, and there's no rooks on the board. Really, is it going to happen for me? And this endgame is a real clinic. So a lot of chumps would play a4 here saying to themselves, oh, I get to blockade the pawns. And it's true, you've blockaded the pawns, congratulations. But then we understand what the actual intent for black is. Black would like to play g6, exclam, and then bring the king over. After which we have a really kind of defensible position. Why? Because we kept the pawn on f7. So what bishop c4 is doing is saying, please, black, move your pawn. And it's very interesting to think about where I spent a lot of time on like F6 and F5. And the bummer with both of those moves, and Bricard gives some nice variations, is now white is getting entry into the black position. Very uncomfortable for black. So 
Uh, and again, detailed analysis about how that might go down. So I came up with king g8, correct? And then what's interesting though is I tried to imagine, well, what's best play after that? And what I saw, very interesting, is that first I was like, oh, I can do this and force the f pawn to move. But unfortunately, after king g6, king f6, maybe I don't have so much. So then I said to myself, well, maybe h5 and then king f8 and maybe black can hold. And so this just gives you a great example. This is what I mean by a poem in mastering is what uh, Ulf did is really powerful. Ulf plays it this way and it's just a beauty because why does a chump GM like myself not even really consider this? Because then queen d1, h5. My mind just draws a blank, okay? So uh, this actually was played in the game. So really, you know, again, an example of mastery. And queen d1, king g2, queen h5, and then this beautiful tickle of a move, queen e8, where there is no king g6, my friend, because we're winning the queen, okay? Delightful chess. And what's the point now? That there's no way for your king to come in contact with the f-pawn. So that if you move that f-pawn, I will then get access to that g8 square. And the big picture with all bishops of opposite color endings, or not only endings, but middle games as well, is can I achieve an initiative on the light squares, right? And what's so cool about this example is usually we say you need two weaknesses to win a game. Here, really, unclear. But in Bishops of Opposite Color, it's kind of like a different deal because if I start ripping it apart on the light squares, as we'll see, the end is actually fairly near. So again, if you imagine this position, you'd say to yourself, oh gosh, if I have a chance to win this thing, it's going to take a really long time and black will have to make some mistakes, yada, yada. Let's look at how it went. Let's look at how the master did this. Check to the miserable king. H5, beautiful. Now black plays queen f5, kind of clever, intending bishop e1 uh, if queen e8, gaining some counterplay, right? Okay, what does the master do? Queen d8, excellent. Threatening bishop d3. So no bishop e1 for black. And again, if queen takes h5, we've seen this party before. <laughs> we were going to win, not only win, we're going to win, let's say, the battle of the light squares because that pawn has to move. So black played here. Okay, now it's our turn. And the game just, it just collapses, you know? It just collapses. It's fully good night here. Gonna be mate. That's my sense of what a chess poem is. And one thing I wanna stress is, it's not simply uh, an artistic feature of the game and the appreciation of the game. But as I said before, with chess poems, there's an expanding of consciousness. And so you need, as a chess player, of course, to like raise your level. And that's what this kind of exercise from a strategic standpoint is gonna do. You're gonna be forced to like, you know, follow the footsteps of mastery and try to find some of the moves yourself. Whilst I found most of, at least the gist of the ideas, one thing I will say is the ones I got wrong is when I, for whatever reason, didn't have the mental ability the system to preparedness to really sink into the position. If I casually thought like, oh, that's the answer, boss, here it is. That kind of arrogance was actually, those were the positions where I got things wrong. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about how this book fits into the Chess Dojo training program. It's not there yet, I wanna put it there. We're gonna do May 1st, 2023 is gonna be Dojo 3.0 where we're allowed to bring in some new material into the course. And so my sense is that we have evaluate like a GM by our friend Eugene Perlstein. That begins for maybe players around 1600, right? I think also before 1600, 
it's harder to do strategic exercises because you really need a grasp of the dimension of material. It's very hard to learn that. And really, you're still dropping pieces up until 1600, missing some basic tactics. And so much of these problems do involve not just strategic ideas, but tactical thinking. Now, what's great about Evaluate Like a GM is they chose positions which are deliberately as non-tactical as possible. Of course, there's always some tactics there. So that's about 1600. And then we have this great book that I reviewed called 45 Techniques of Positional Play. Beautiful, I feel like that's the next step up. And then this book, I feel is definitely 2,000 plus, maybe even 2,100 plus. It is difficult and you need some time to go through the uh, positions and really I think to appreciate something like this, right? This is very deep, uh, this kind of example of understanding how the bishops of opposite color really give black a lot of grief. We can imagine that the black player playing Ulf thought they could comfortably hold a draw. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, my friend, there are some deep things going on there. Finally, I wanna give a note of thanks. I think it's very hard for books like this, strategic chess exercises to be published simply because if you're aiming for a higher level of player, uh, there's just not as many of them as the lower rated players. And so I'm thankful. I'm sure this book, for example, I don't, it was kind of like an unknown thing to me. I didn't even know about it. It came out, I think, 2013. And, you know, some people knew about it. And finally, years, 10 years later, it gets around to me by word of mouth. And so I appreciate the effort that goes into a book like that. And I'm sure, uh, you know, for the publishers as well, it wasn't like making a lot of money. So there it is, Strategic Chess Exercises by Emmanuel Bricard from France, GM.